Or I'll move if you really want to sit by yourself. Oh, oh goodness, they did yeah. come. Yeah. Hey. We got home, got changed, and walked here. So. So I can't wow. never later. I'll see you guys walking again. Half hour walking. I wasn't sure you guys were going to make it. Are we going to start the. It's all. Oh, yeah. it's already live? Okay. Sure. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, my name is Kath Silversides. Um, I am an alumni of. Um, fix it, but I have also been a head referee for the last three years in Victoria. Um, so I've done a lot uh, over the years with First Tech Challenge, um, and we're going to be talking about preparing for competition as league events are getting started. Um, as usual, just a big thank you to the University of Victoria for sponsoring and hosting us um, and letting us do this workshop series. It's been awesome to get to do. Um, so today's plan, we're going to be going over inspections. So that's one of the first things that happens when you get to an event. And then we're going to uh, touch on wiring because that seems to be a problem that all robots need a little bit of work on. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about match flow. And then we're going to go over rules. And then we'll have some time for questions and Q&A at the end. So there's two main inspections that happen at events. Uh, we do a robot inspection and we do a field inspection. So robot inspection is a uh, robot. Hi, come on in. Um, we, for a robot inspection, there needs to be about, uh, there needs to be one to two team members minimum. Um, this is because, and ideally there are people that know about the robot. So there's gonna be a volunteer doing the inspection with you and Ideally, they have the team members that are there are able to answer questions. Um, it's always fun to have to go chase down another team member to ask a detailed question about a robot. Um, robot inspection is also when the capstone is going to get inspected, um, and the alliance markers are going to get inspected um, during robot inspection this year. That's a new thing this year is the teams are providing their own alliance markers, so that's an important thing to do. 
deal inspection. Um, obviously, we still need the robot, um, but this time we need drive team members present and um, the driver stations, the Android devices are important for that. Can we, we're gonna go into the robot inspection? Okay, um, so the bit one, there's a lot of big pieces and there's a bunch of little stuff that happens during robot inspection. Some of the big stuff is the sizing cube. So your robot needs to fit within the 18 inch sizing cube. This is for when your robot is at the start of the match. So if your robot holds an arm in a funny position, we need to have that arm in a funny position while we're doing the sizing cube. The other thing that's really important is that the robot shouldn't be pushing the edges of the plastic or scraping the plastic. It should The sizing cube should be able to fit nicely on and nicely off. Um, it can be hard to judge in advance because you're eyeballing it with the tape measure. It's always best to aim for just under, like 17 and a half if you can. It's better to just be clearly within the 18 inches than to be pushing the outside edges. Um, the other piece is that for whatever reason, if you're planning on having two different arms during the event, we need to have those at inspection to happen for it to get inspected while we're doing the sizing cube and other things. Um, the robot gets weighed, that's another big thing. Uh, 42 pounds, I believe, is the weight. Um, and then the inspector's gonna make sure that you have right labels, so team numbers. Um, you're encouraged to use Arial font, bold, uh, 250 point size, but any font can be used as long as it's a contrasting background and it meets the minimum width requirement and height requirement. Um, there are motion warning labels. So these are for if the, your servos or motors move during initialization. And that's in the period while the robot is getting set up before the match actually starts, if the motors need to move into position. Um, and then a power switch label. This is that us referees and volunteers can turn off your robot if we have to. Ideally, we don't go inside the field during the two and a half minutes for safety concerns, but if your robot is doing something major, sometimes we need to turn it off. Um, Alliance markers, as I touched on those earlier, um, they're team provided. There is a link for um, a default template the only requirement is that the markers be uh, blue and red and that they be approximately two and a half inches in width. Um, they can be circles, they can be squares, they can be triangles, they can be any shape you want, but a nice solid blue and a, no? What is red, what is blue? What, sir, what is a square, what is a circle? Use the template. <laughs> red circle, blue square. Did anyone see the most, some of the Q and A's? Because I, I thought I read a Q and A that said they have to be approximately those sizes and that they don't need to be a circle and a square. Okay. That's something we, we're gonna be talking about Q&A questions later, and we'll touch <laughs> on that again. <laughs> um, and then the team scoring element. And uh, there's lots of details about the requirements for the team scoring element in the uh, game manuals. I'm uh, gonna go into the next slide. Oh, so wiring, right. So these are some examples of some wiring that can happen to competition, can happen during a build season. Um, what are some things that could cause problems for the robot with this type of wiring? Since there's a few people to answer questions, yes? The encoder wire is the chain. Yes, so in this case, you can see there's wires that seem to be going around the chain here. That's really dangerous because the wire might get cut. Same with gears, um, can get cut using um, gearing or chain. Um, recommendations for fixing that, um, I don't know if this wire could like come up to this channel and get attached along this channel and then move over or something. Some ways to fix that. There's other things that you can see. Yeah. Good luck trying to diagnose which wire is malfunctioning. Yes, so which wire is loose, which wire is not connecting properly, those are going to be hard things to figure out. Um, so it, it's important to think through your wiring the other thing is, and these robots don't necessarily show it as well, but sometimes if you have a long arm and you have something at the end of the arm, you want to, you want to, sometimes teams have a wire that kind of droops down, and that's really an entanglement risk. And so it's really important to try and get tackled ahead of time when you're doing your wiring and to try and route it along the, whatever mechanism you have there. Um, you can see here this team might have been trying, I think there's probably this mechanism lifts up and down, and it looks like there's kind of some sort of loop of wire in here that the robot might be trying to contain, um, but you just have to be really careful with those types of mechanisms. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, 
I was hoping to watch a bit of a video with you. Unfortunately, we can't get sound to work in this room, so I've included a link down here. Do we normally post the slides? Yep. Okay. Um, if you can hit play and then hit uh, large screen and hit pause, I'm going to at least show the... Um, uh, so I just need to get on to the next screen after this one. So just like another minute over. Can you just move it? The timestamp? I'm working on it. Do you want the so slide? At 12, uh, 12, 12 minutes. Or 12 minutes and 50 seconds. Oh, you said minute. 13 is probably fine. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this video is a 20 minute video um, that First Year Challenge has on their video feed that is about wiring in all descriptions and capacities, talking about how to wire your phone, how to wire your controller. Um, this is the tips and tricks second section. I would encourage you to listen to the whole 20 minute video. I know it's a long time, but there's a lot of, if you think about your robot, there's a lot of wires and a lot of connections between your motors, your encoders, and the um, control hubs, or the expansion hubs, um, and the different pieces. So it's important to know how to maintain your robot, essentially. Um, so strain relief is something that's discussed here. Um, that's basically when you use a zip tie and you, the strain relief is just so that it doesn't, the wire doesn't move, essentially. Um, sometimes, in some situations, if it is a wire that needs to move, sometimes you can use elastic bands as strain relief. So there's a bit of flexibility, but it's also contained. Um, mounting electronics on rigid, non-conductive plates. Some teams find problems with their electronics getting discharges from metal, and so it's recommended to attach them to a plastic sheet, either acrylic or polycarbonate, um, and then attach that onto the metal, so that way there's a, there's an electro there's a barrier between metal and the electronics. Um, clips, zip ties, um, electrical tape. There are many different ways that you can use to uh, control um, your wiring, all recommended. Sometimes for some, um, for some of the, like the phones and the control and the expansion hub, you can 3D print or machine some form of strain relief that is um, just like a little like plastic add-on to the thing, to the module that can help support the USB cable or whatever cable is coming out of there. Um, conduct maintenance. It's really easy for teams to be making a quick fix and not necessarily rewire the robot correctly. And so it's important to set aside time to check that your wires are still where you want them to be and are still doing well. Um, keep wires neat. This is very much similar to the other discussion points above. Um, it's encouraged, though, when you're bending your wires, to watch how much flexibility is in the wire. Some wires don't like getting bent around like a 90 degree right angle, and other wires are completely fine going in circles. So sometimes you need to really watch your wires and how many times you loop them back and forth. Um, we were just talking about wire management again, same thing. Um, if we can go another minute or two till we get to the next set of tips and tricks. I might be closer to 15 or 17. There we go. So this is again a lot of repeating a lot of the same things. Um, tie down all your wires. Avoid um, avoid having wires or moving parts. It, it, I know it's hard because the motors are what move and drive your robot, but if you can, make it so your motor is just a little further back than the moving part of your robot, that's helpful. Um, and if not, just be really careful where those wires go around that area. Um, think about trying to do a wiring diagram. Um, I often use a sheet of paper and then block out, like this is a motor and this is the expansion hub. And here's a wire that goes between here and here. And it goes into port one on the expansion hub. And that is the left front motor of the robot so that you can visually look at something and track all your wires. This is incredibly helpful for your programmers when they're getting started, so that they can get started actually programming and not having to chase down where all the electronics are connected. Use the proper tools. Um, it's worth it to make sure that you get you know, an actual wire cutter and um, a wire stripper and consider getting an, and an Anderson power pole connector. Um, other teams might have tools that you can borrow at events to make fixes. But it also is important just for your own team to have the right stuff. 
tools also extend to things like getting zip ties and getting electrical tape so you have those things to make use of as well when you're doing it. Labeling your wires is awesome. Um, a lot of, yeah, I heavily encourage teams to do it. Um, you can use electrical tape and just kind of make like a little flag on the tape and then write in a sharpie or you can use some other forms of tape. Those are usually the easiest. Um, the other thing I've seen teams do is on like your expansion hub, you could put a little white paper label and then write on it. Um, but it's often better to actually tape the wire or label the wire itself rather than the connection point because the wire itself is what's actually communicating, not where it's connected to and from. Uh, build structures to rewires. If your wire needs to go in a location that's funny and there's nothing there to support it, consider putting a piece of beam along there or some sort of um, axle or something, just something hard so the wire has something to be supported by. You could also use a piece of plastic. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, we have some wires and robots that were decently wired. And this is where every team has a slightly different opinion on what's good and what's bad. And sometimes different things require different things. You can see the teams have used a lot of uh, cable ties, zip ties, um, and that's really common. Um, you can also see this team here has used um, a cable wrap to help control their wiring around an area. Um, but at the same time, this team over here um, decided that due to the lengths of their wires or whatever, they needed to have their wire cross over their chain. Now, we can't see depth in this photo as well as I would like, so I can't tell if like there's a good gap between where the wire passes over and where that chain is, or if it's actually quite close. Um, and this is where you kind of have to look at every robot and make decisions about it. There's no right or way, wrong way. Um, there's often just, you know, there is a hazard here and we need to fix it. Um, type of approach to wiring. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned about wiring and stuff is the placements of your different pieces of electronics. Um, one thing that is really hard to see is a team that has a bad placement for their battery pack. Um, if your battery pack, um, it gets quite heavy and quite large, and so as your robot's driving around the field, it's going to jostle and rattle around a bit, unless you have a really stable way to connect your battery pack. And my recommendation is to have some sort of metal front and back and hopefully side to side as well so that it can slot in. And then you have some way, either like maybe some screws and a piece of plastic or piece of metal across the top to physically hold your battery pack in as tightly as you can without actually crushing it in any capacity. And you need it to be quick to remove because you're going to possibly be replacing your battery throughout the day or to recharge it. And that's why the screws, if you, even if it's just two screws, that's helpful. Um, but it's really hard to see teams that have attached the battery in a way that rattles loose and then there's a robot with a battery dragging behind it on the field. Um, and that kind of causes hazards for everyone, but also it's just dangerous in case another robot interacts with that battery as well. Um, before we move on from wiring, because it's easier to talk about wiring when we have photos, is there any questions about wiring in particular? That's okay. Uh, next slide. Okay, field inspection. Um, I will fully admit that I often don't do a ton of field inspection because I'm often doing hardware inspection. Um, but one thing that's been implemented in the last year, which was really awesome, was this concept of doing a pit inspection. And this can help improve the flow of the day by getting teams to get a little bit of inspection done before they get to hardware inspection or do the field, the main field inspection. Um, the pit inspection, all we need to do is to have both of your of the phones on. So both your driver station and your um, robot controller phone need to be on for it to happen. And basically, we get the two apps to talk to each other. And on the driver station app, there's a self-inspection list that we basically go through and double check that you're able to connect and that you have the right um, names for both devices and a whole bunch of uh, your version numbers are the same. And those types of things can happen before we actually do field inspection proper, um, which is awesome to kind of keep the day moving. Um, so like I said, you need to use the driver stations, um, use the self-inspection, 
the version number this year is 2.5 or higher. Um, it's also really important that the version numbers between your devices are the exact same number. Um, sometimes the version number changes throughout the year, but it's important to make sure that those same number between the devices. Um, any phones you're going to be using that day need to get named correctly, and that's using your team number. So it's your team number, dash, um, if it's your A set, you put an A. If it's your B set of phones, you put a B. And then dash, um, RC or DS, depending on if it's the driver station or the robot controller. Um, and then we go to actual field inspection. If you haven't done a pit inspection, it would happen when you come to field inspection proper. Um, and then we, the inspector will just remind you of the match flow again. Um, this is because sometimes different things happen events and the detail is another way to do it. Um, and then we actually get you to demonstrate that your robot runs during autonomous if it does that. How your team and if you're, it, we also get you to demonstrate the switch between autonomous and teleop. We just check that your robot's running. Um, this is also a good time to ask questions of people who usually have an idea of what's going on and you can get help if you need to. Ideally you get help before you come to inspections, but there's always a time to get those things fixed. Um, for field inspection, I kind of mentioned it earlier that we want your drive team. You're required to have your coach and a drive, a one drive team member, um, but I recommend anyone who's going to be driving the robot come to field inspection and just get all that information at one time. Uh, so I think we're going to go over a bit of front match routine. Um, so at the when you come to a tournament, um, there's often a period of time when we're doing inspections, and that usually takes an hour, one to two hours of the morning, which is a quite a long period of time, and that's optimistically. Um, I would love to get through inspections that fast. Um, and then we get into, and it's important in that time that teams are ready with their robots so that they can come to inspections ready to get inspected. Um, it, we all know that you're gonna be making changes to your robot, it doesn't need to be perfect the major components need to be ready so that we can inspect them. And if you do do something major between when you get first inspected and when we start matches, just come let the referees know or come let the inspectors know and they'll re-inspect and I'm sure it'll be okay. I'm guessing it'll be okay. Maybe not, but um, then we can finally get to matches. And so often we start with queuing and you usually get queued for your match, ahead, one match ahead. So if you're in match seven, let's say, we often get you to queue during match five or six, so that way you're ready at the field so we can run matches as quickly as possible so that we can hopefully, we can all play as many matches as we want to play that day. Um, we try and get through five matches per team in a day, which is a lot. Um, and so often, so we have tables on both sides of the playing field normally for queuing. Um, so the red team will be on one side, blue team will be on the other. This can change slightly at events. Uh, it just depends how big the event is and what our resources are that day. Um, but normally we get EQ'd. This is a good time to talk to your alliance partner for that match and ask about strategy. Um, do you, which side, where exactly do you place your robot? What's your um, autonomous program like? Where can, where does your autonomous program go? Is it gonna interfere with our robot or not? Um, so those are some things to do during your time while you're waiting for the matches to start. Because um, I talked about trying to be efficient with time, it's also really important that when you're invited to come to the field and set up, that you do it as quickly as you can. We know there are things that go wrong and sometimes the robot disconnects and we need to restart. But it's also really good if we can keep the matches moving quickly. Um, you are allowed to run um, an off mode to, again, if you need to get something into a, a mechanism into a specific position, you are allowed to run that while you're setting up, but again, you just need to be quickly so we can keep the matches flowing quickly. Um, randomization will happen. Um, this has been a thing that's been going on in First Strike Challenge for a while, which just adds a lot of excitement to the game. Um, but it's also really important that you don't touch your phones after randomization has happened. Um, and that's part of just the fairness of play that we're just asking everyone to follow by. Um, if you do need to touch your robot or your phone, um, we will often restart. We can also call a penalty if it's been happening multiple times to your team. So we encourage you to just be ready. And once the referees have said, okay, randomization is happening, just step back and wait for autonomous to start. Um, safety is really important around the field. We are dealing with robots with moving parts and lots of metal and things. Um, safety glasses, um, 
closed toed shoes are required. Um, we're this year, you're not allowed to step over the bridge, so please step out of the field and walk around. I'm sure we're all going to be getting used to that because normally during setup and during cleanup, we're used to walking around the field. Um, and keeping the hands out of the field during the matches. Now, this is not as relevant to the human player, but even the human player has to wait for the robot to be outside of the depot before they um, put a stone in to play. Um, at the end of the match, um, it's good to wait just a few seconds and review the score with the referees before you do clean up. Um, hopefully we're running matches in a schedule that we can allow time for proper review of the scores. Sometimes we're running matches quite tightly and we don't have as much time to do that and we just run to the next match as fast as we can. But hopefully if we're all on schedule, we can do that. Next slide. Um, this is a game. It's important to know the rules of the game you're playing. Um, as a referee, this is one of my pet peeves, is people that don't know the rules. Um, this is something that I will spend the next week learning quite heavily. I will fully admit I have not fully understood the rules yet this year. Um, competitions in a week, I'll know them by then. Um, it's also important to know that there's actually a game, there are more, there's, there's more than one game manual, and there's robot rules in both of them. Um, things about the tournament, the robot, and inspections are all in game manual part one. Game rules specific to this year and game definitions are all in game manual part two. Um, I encourage every driver, every coach, every team member to really read the rules. Um, it's important for those people at the field to know what the, what the rules are and what penalties can be, but it's also important for everyone on the team when you're doing strategy to know what's gonna, what could happen as well. Um, the other thing is, is any form answer questions that have been legal, um, that have been posted, usually they post on about the Thursday before the event, so it's usually two days um, before the event, um, to read the, to see if there's been any new form questions, and then you can, before the event, and those form questions um, don't precede the game rules, but they are as relevant as the game rules in terms of priority and understanding these rules. Um, all of the these PDFs are and or forms are available um, from the game season info. I left a link there, but it's pretty easy to Google and find them. Um, so what we're going to do is just go over a few of the forum questions that have come up this year so far. Um, this is always a fun piece of you know thinking about the different things that might happen. Um, this question is specifically about the autonomous period. Um, teams can come up with all sorts of ways of looking at the rules and finding loopholes that might be there or might not, and they just answer these. So the summary of this question is that a robot, or the team has realized that if, uh, say, the blue robot drives across through the red fields. Um, stones, it would block the Red Alliance Bridge. And if it sits there, they might incur a penalty, a 20-point penalty. And this might be a very good trade point-wise if the opposing alliance has a autonomous program that scores more than 20 points. And they're asking, is there any other rules we could break if we do this? Um, just to kind of get your feelings on this, what do you think about this concept of a strategy? I, I like, any opinions that FaZe had? Mm. You don't like that strategy? <laughs> Worse, um, I don't think that's very fair to the other alliance if they have a good autonomous, but they've got some obstacles that should be there. Yeah, it's not very fair, definitely. So, isn't this similar to like when there was a team last year that pushed to a robot for four seconds and then left them there four seconds again? So that's a blocking type question, um, and that's a slightly different rule, but it's a very similar situation. You're imposing a rule to the extent of the rule and seeing how far you can push the rule, kind of. Um, blocking, in that situation, again, it's repeated blocking, and so that falls under another set of rules instead of just the blocking rules. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we've got the answer. And that's kind of what it came up with here, was that 
sure you're breaking this one rule specifically, but there's this whole list of other things you're also breaking at the same time. And depending on the situation, the referee can award any number of penalties. And if it's seen as a strategy by the referees, um, that can start incurring other penalties and egregious behavior type penalties, which you know can escalate quite far. Um, but it's part of understanding the spirit of the rule and the spirit of the game alongside of the actual rule of the game. Um, and that's just kind of a balancing act. So this one specifically mentions about interfering with blocking access to their sky bridge, um, interfering with their alliance's quarry, and um, blocking the alliance um, robot from doing things. Um, an intentional rule of violation, which is another piece that can happen as well. Um, anything else about this question that anyone has any curiosities about? So uh, I've got another two questions um, from the forum. I can just go through the next one. Um, so this one is about the end game. Is it legal to take a preloaded capstone, so the capstone's already on the robot, place it onto a stone during the game, um, and then place it onto the skyscraper of the foundation during end game? So there's been a lot of clarifications about how the, sky stone is, how the, sky, how the capstone is used and how the stones are used. Um, capstones cannot get scored until end game, which is really relevant in this question. Um, but the stones can get scored at any time. Um, you are also allowed to have a capstone and a stone on your robot at the same time. That was another Q&A question that had to get clarified um, that's relevant to this. Um, opinions on this? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, and that's, that's actually a very good answer, is that you know you think that's the correct answer, um, but it may not always be the answer that the referees have come to. Um, and this is because sometimes they're looking at things from another angle, a safety angle, or a strategy angle, that they're like, oh, wait a second, here's this other strategy that teams have been talking about. And allowing this might allow this strategy that we don't want to allow necessarily. Um, can we go on to the next slide, or the next? Yes. Yes, this is a completely fine thing to do. Um, it, sometimes you just need to ask a really straightforward question in the forums because you're just not sure. Um, and this is where there's been a, there was enough legal wording that had been a, happening around capstones and regular stones that this team just wanted to get this clarified. It seemed like a straightforward thing, but let's just get it clarified. Um, the next question actually is a three-part question. <laughs> it's a little long. Um, so this question is about blocking access to the depot. This is another autonomous period question. Um, and so this is the opposing alliance um, going through their depot during autonomous. Now, during driver control period, the depot is where the uh, human player will place stones into the depot. And it's really important that the opposing alliance doesn't go in the depot during um, off mode, during driver control mode, and during end game. Um, but during autonomous, there wasn't a lot of clarification. So um, the robot can repeatedly drive through the opposing alliance's um, depot to get stones during autonomous period. So that's clarifying that there's stones already there. There's no stones sitting there at the beginning of autonomous period. So something has happened to make a stone go into that area of the field um, during autonomous already. And if it's on the red, if the red depot, the blue alliance has seen that there's a stone there somehow with the robot and is going and getting it, uh, which I think is impressive programming, um, and it's completely fine to do. Um, you can see very quickly at the bottom the answer for part one is yes. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, um, if the robot experiences unusual behavior, this happens a lot in Tom's programming. You think you know what the robot's going to do, you run it, and it doesn't quite do what you expect it to do. Um, this is also one where they, if you end up in the depot during autonomous and your first action during driver control is to leave the depot, you're not going to incur a penalty. That is completely what is the intention there. Um, now there's another question here. This is why this question, like they want to clarify some simple things and then they get into some more detailed things. Um, if during a Thomas period, the blue alliance pur purposely pushes stones into the opposing alliance's depot, um, 
they feel like there might be some strategic value to this, um, is that allowed or not? And the answer, as you can see, is a big warning <laughs> about um, illegal use of gameplay elements. And this is at the discretion of the referees, so this is part of the strategy, if we see a strategy in what you're doing. Um, a single stone in the depot is expected. The human player will place stones in the depot later. We're not, we're not opposed to there being stones in the depot. But if there's a strategic around blocking the depot from the opposing alliance, if you're blocking the opposing alliance's depot from their own robots, that's a problem. And that's something that needs to get confirmed, or get a penalty for, or get a warning about, and then a penalty. And so there's a whole list of questions. Um, some of the questions in the forums are about what types of motors you're allowed, because some teams found a motor that they'd like to try, and is it or is it not allowed? Um, questions about um, on your camera phone. Um, there's usually some phones have a flashlight, and some teams found that it's really helpful to have the flashlight running during when they're taking photos for their image analysis, and that's allowed as well this year. Um, but last year it was only allowed halfway through the season, so there was a clarification that that is going to be allowed this year as well. So it's important to read through these Q&As because sometimes things can drastically change. Um, one interesting Q&A that I didn't include here, which I thought was very interesting, was um, teams had realized that if they set up underneath the sky bridge and they sit in the sky bridge during the entire autonomous period, they technically would score for being in the opposite zone. Because um, if you move from the loading zone to the building zone during autonomous, you get points. And the Q&A forum came back going, no, that's not a allowed strategy. If we're going to clarify the rules, you have to be in the loading zone when you set up your robot and then move into the building zone. So again, that's kind of an important thing to know is where your robot's going to be set up. Move on to the next slide. Uh, just a reminder about league events. Um, so Victoria is going to be next, not this Saturday, but next Saturday. Vancouver's is happening the week after that. Um, I hope to see you all there. I hope you have robots that work. Um, if you're not having, if you're having troubles with your robots, reach out to other teams. Um, some teams will be happy to answer email questions, or if they have time, come visit um, and try and get your robot working. It's nice to show up to the event already having a robot that's working because then you can get through inspections and get the day started. But if not, you know, you got a bit of time to get things fixed. Um, next slide. Any, any other questions? You can always talk afterwards if not. But. Does the chat have any questions? <laughs> yep, yeah, if we're able to read the chat questions. There were two, now there's one. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it. They, they heard my voice and left. That's okay. Um, we do have, oh, um, we do have a copy of the field inspection checklist and the robot inspection checklist. Um, are you from the same team? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna give this to you. You can take them home. Um, I encourage you to go over your robot with them in the next week. Um, and that way, hopefully, your inspection happens a bit faster the day of, because you've already seen what those questions are going to be. Um, yeah, next slide is fine. Um, just another big thing to the university. Um, they've been providing us this space for the last six weeks, which has been awesome um, for the last workshops. And it's been awesome to have their support in getting to run these workshops here. So, big thank you to them. Is there another one? Yep, that's it. That's it. Okay. Do we stop? Here? Cool. Okay. So now the people have questions, now they know it's not on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs>